Okay, so the title of my talk today is, is Decoding Cells with AI. I know that it's a very pretentious title because, uh, and the first question that comes to your mind is why decode, why do we need to decode cells anyways, right? As you guys saw, like Beth showed that cells differ a lot morphologically, you can see that they, they are very different, but the very definition of cell type is something that is loose, right? Like uh, how, how, how can you define what is a cell type and what is just like a very small subset. And of course, immunologists use some markers to, to define some groups of cells. But if you keep going, like if you keep adding more and more uh, markers, then you're gonna see that you can, uh, I'm gonna switch to it. to even more specialized uh, functions, right? And here's just an example of uh, a paper that uh, we, we collaborate with Zeka and, and published recently, showing a very small subset of C CD39 positive plasma B cells that actually is immune suppressive. So uh, how in, in the lab we can use uh, AI tools to, to try to understand more uh, of this difference between cells and also what they are doing in, in the immune responses. So we actually have two different approaches. One is using machine learning, which is the, the, the core of the lab. But we also have some uh, four people working with the computer vision uh, parts. And we also have the other one with, is with LLM, large language models, and chat GPT. Uh, but I'm not going to show you uh, why, why we are using with this. So just an example of how we use machine learning is uh, Carlos' uh, paper, where he took several primary, uh, several brain metastasis samples that came from different origins, melanoma, lung, uh, ovary, renal cancers. And we wanted to understand what are the common mechanisms between the, these metastases, why, why they, they go to the brain and install there, right? So the first thing we can use machine learning is to try to define the markers that separate and, and are used to annotate the cell types. So this is what he did to identify the cell types that were there in these metastases. And then the second part we, we use to try to understand the communication between cells. So we have to de detect patterns that can tell us uh, what is the real uh, communication between the cell types. And then we use spatial transcriptomics to try to validate some of the, the connections that we thought was happening in the brain metastasis. And a very summary overview of what we think is going on is here. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of this. Because I want to talk about uh, spatial transcriptomics part, which is the, my new passion. So we, we all really like, like to, to work with this. And one of the first studies that uh, we analyzed was actually the, the mouse brain, because uh, we all know uh, about the different cell types that are there in the brains, but actually there are a lot of different questions that you cannot answer with flow cytometry or uh, image or only a single cell. You need to have the spatial transcriptomics uh, information. And then we use a data set that, that uses technology called Murfish that allows you not only to see the single cell, but also to look at the single transcripts within the cell. You can, it's a lot of data uh, there. And the first thing that we did, this is the image already of the paper, we have three sections of the, the, the mouse brain. And then the, uh, the first thing we want is to compare the, the data with what is known with the, the mouse brain. So what is in the textbook. But there are dozens of regions of, uh, in the mouse brain uh, that uh, it's hard to compare when you put the real data there. So the, the textbook is the, the grid, the red grid lines, and the real data is the, the gray ones. You see that it's, of course, not, not, never gonna match the, the real the, the textbook. So what we did was to look at uh, what astronomers was doing to, to detect uh, stars in the in skies. So we repositioned, actually, uh, a tool from astronomers that has the same problem, but now we could transform uh, this data and now see what are the cells that are in the specific regions that are actually in the textbook. And then we follow the, the normal analysis where we first annotate the cell types and then we put back into the regions. And as you guys can see, like uh, if you look at some specific cell types, they are very well located. But if you take actually these cells and then subcluster them, 
and then creates 22 different subclusters. And then when you put back into the brain, it's amazing how they are actually uh, very specifically located. You know, that has nothing to do with the spatial. That was clustered based on the expression profile. Uh, and then we developed this tool called Archipelago because uh, the spatial transcriptomics allows you to, to gather the, the image. So you know the exact position of uh, the X, Y coordinates of the cells, and also what is inside the cells, the transcriptome that is inside the cells. So, uh, but the problem is that most of the tools that uh, deals with spatial transcriptomics, they work this way. First, they identify the cell types based on the expression profile. Oh, these are astrocytes, these are microglia. And then they put back into the, into the image. So we, this is not what we wanted. We wanted to see where the biological processes is activated or inhibits in the image. So for example, we want to see where inflammation is occurring, where apoptosis, autophagy is happening, regardless of the cell type. And, and, and there is no tool that uh, reliably do the, this kind of uh, analysis. And that's why we developed this uh, method called Archipelago. So this method works this way. Uh, this is an image of a lung biopsy, a real one. And uh, the first thing we did was, okay, let's see if we take 36 genes related to inflammation, if we can detect the areas that are enriched for inflammation in this lung biopsy. When you do this, you see like this heat map, but it's very hard to define the regions, right? Because it's a heat map. And then we had the idea of transforming this enrichment into a, a height. And then we have actually now a landscape so the biopsy becomes a landscape where you can uh, flood with water to really see the areas that are above the waters, which are the areas that have, are enriched for the biological process that you want. And just for fun, you can print if you want to in a 3D printer, so you have a large uh, scale biopsy. But uh, what we really want to do is to compare the islands. So if we take genes related to exhausted T cells, the cells that are tired of fighting cancer, these are the islands of that lung biopsy. And if you do the same thing with effector T cell genes, these are the islands and the same biopsy. And now if you look at the, the genes related to proliferation, these are the islands. And then you can navigate uh, on these cells, on these islands, and then see what is inside. So how much of these islands are actually composed of my, uh, fib fibroblasts, tumor cells, T cells, but that's not what I think is the, the, the most interesting part. The most interesting part to me is actually to compare islands. So for example, if you take these 3D islands and then you convert into a 2D image, then you can just say, I want to see uh, how close the islands of exhausted T cells are compared to tumor cells. Same thing with effector T cells, the cells that actually kills tumors. Then you can see how far or close they are from tumor cells. And then you can quantify this distance, and that can give you a metric of what is the gene set or biological process that is close to cancer or far away from cancer or any other uh, condition that you want to, to study. So that is the, the archipelago. But then we also had the idea of applying the archipelago to single cell data, even if, if you don't have the spatial information. So we, we generate uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis uh, data set, single cell from the skin of patients. And then uh, we, we face several problems. So this is not a spatial data. Uh, you, you know you map, right? So you can do dimension reductions and then clustering, and then you identify this colored cl cluster here. But then when you, go, when you start annotating the cell types, you realize that actually some of the cells that are actually for example, exhausted CD80 cells do not belong exactly to the cluster that was identified there. Same thing, another problem, common problem, is that you have a UMAP with a bunch of cells that have no uh, subclusters, but then when you look at uh, specific uh, genes, you find that actually that cluster, that big cluster could have like small clusters. And the other problem is that sometimes you have a cluster that have some cells that are located outside that clusters because the clustering has no uh, strict association with the, the dimension reduction. And then what you really want is to see what is uh, in the cluster. So you guys can see it. It's the same problem of the spatial transcriptomics where you have the XY coordinates, but in this case you have the UMAP coordinates. 
And then you can apply uh, archipelago, for example. You can first do the enrichment analysis of uh, certain markers and then display on your uh, UMAP. And then you use the archipelago to flood the, with water to, to see what are the cells that are really the ones that uh, have specific functions. And this way we can see, for example, where are the, the Tregs, uh, Cytotoxus T cells, TH1 cells in the skin of leishmaniasis patients. And that's how we use Archipelago to, to pinpoint what are the single cells uh, that are relevant for our uh, study. We also have some computer vision projects, which is not my expertise, but uh, that started with model when we, we were able to detect parasites using image and cell phones. So we want a low resolution image uh, uh, coupled to, to microscope to, to detect uh, parasites. So we did this for uh, T, T. cruzi, and now we are doing for leishmaniasis, uh, leishmania, to try to identify different strains just by looking at the, the, the image. Uh, we also work with video. So uh, I realized that uh, in, in pedi pediatricians, they actually uh, assess if there is a distress in the breathing of the baby by looking at how the baby is breathing. If you, if you are a parent, you know like if your baby is breathing normally or not. Same thing with physicians. They don't have actually a machine that tells how bad or how, how good the, the breathing is. It's something that they are trained, but it's almost subjectively. And then uh, we had the idea of actually why not filming the, the, the chest of someone and then quantifying the distance and create numbers that can be used to monitor the, the baby uh, breathing. And this is me uh, after uh, exercise or before, so you can see like uh, this is a very simple uh, solution, and that's uh, Mauro's uh, baby, where he was start playing with this uh, data. We also apply uh, this computer vision approach for detecting uh, monkeypox lesions, and that actually gave like a very nice uh, accuracy. And my dream is actually to, to create something portable where we can put this software uh, inside and send to remote areas of Brazil. But what I want to show uh, today is this project that combines uh, precision medicine with computer vision called Immunovis. And, uh, and the project is based on the fact that neural networks works very, very well to classify image. So if you put the image of a, a mole, it's, it's, it can tell you if that actually is a melanoma or not, right? This is, there is even apps that, that do that. But if you actually extract the RNA from this sample, and then you have now expression profile of these samples, 20,000 rows, 20,000 genes, and dozens of samples, and then you use the same neural network algorithms, you are gonna fail the, to, to, to find reliable biomarkers. It's not gonna, uh, be that simple as it is with uh, image. And the reason for that is not because the neural network uh, does not uh, work well. It is because biology is much more complex than, than this. So you have uh, different sets of genes that uh, may explain why the person has cancer or, or any other disease. So uh, if you are trying to find, if the algorithms try to find the minimum set of genes that predicts uh, an outcome, it's gonna fail when you try to validate this in real life with different data sets. So if you, you can reduce this complexity and put into actually an image, that may be a, a good solution. So the idea in this project is actually to put the genes, to transform the expression profile into an image, and then you use neural networks to classify the, the sample. It's basically you uh, create uh, uh, an image to the image, which is fixed. It's like a, a color book, empty, where you can paint the color book with the profile of that specific uh, person. Uh, and in theory, it would work like this. You have the genes, the, the, the circles, positioned in, in a way that uh, they have relationship between them. And then you can paint, for example, with three different profiles of cancer patients or three different uh, profiles of normal patients, and then you, you're gonna see where the, the algorithm are gonna see where the, the image is actually brighter or not, right? Uh, it's, it's more or less like a, 
how many dots you need to say that this is the number three, right? You can do with thousands of points or you can do with a few points and it's still gonna be a num number three. And then you can train this neural network and when you have new samples, you can uh, test if this uh, works or not. We have already uh, tested on several conditions. One is the skin of humans. This is the position of the 2D image of the genes in the human skin. And these are uh, three images of three different patients with cutaneous leishmaniasis. Oh, no, this is normal uh, health controls. And these are four people with uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. You see, you don't even need uh, PIXMI or any other software image to say that there is a, a big difference, right? Same thing with uh, bloods. These are the bloods of health people, and these are the bloods of uh, people with acute infection of ch with chikungunya. You also have similar profile with dengue, uh, yellow fever, and uh, influenza. So just to conclude, uh, what I try to show is some of the tools that uh, computational tools that we have been developing over the years uh, at USP and Einstein. And uh, as Beth, uh, I have a lot of empathy for people that do not know how to program. So because I'm a biologist that had to learn ad hoc like her. And that's why I always try to make uh, things easier for people that uh, are not uh, experts on bioinformatics. And a tool that is not there in the panel that I showed that uh, actually was uh, finished today by an undergrad student was this one called Chromo. So Chromo is, is, a, is a tool that allows you to see the regions, the activity of, of uh, genes, proteins, uh, DNA accessibility, or any information of chromosomes over all the, the chromosomes that you have. So as a proof of concept, uh, the, the students, Pedro, what he did was to took single cell RNA-seq data of the brain of uh, four patients, four, four Down syndrome patients and eight uh, health controls. And then we identified the cell types, the, the neuro excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, uh, oligodendrocytes, etc. And then we put uh, this into Chrome, Chromo. So uh, Chromo defined already the differentially expressed genes per chromosome. And uh, I'm, not gonna sh I'm not showing this graph, but this is just to show that when you do this uh, analysis per cell type, you see that people that have Down syndrome have higher expression of genes in general compared to controls for uh, mi microglia, astrocytes, etc. But when you look at uh, inhibitory and incitatory neurons, actually you have down regulations of genes. So most of the genes are actually down regulating Down syndrome only for neurons and, and not for the other cell types. And what the tool does that actually is nice is actually to give you this overview of what's happening per chromosome, where are the regions that are actually activated or uh, inhibits in a condition. And in this case, it's just to show that uh, having three chromosomes of uh, 321 chromosome give you like this uh, chromosome 21 uh, red color, but you see several interesting colors uh, of uh, regions such as uh, chromosome 14 that maybe explain that why the phenotype of Down syndrome not necessarily has to do with genes and proteins that are in the chromosome 21. And uh, to, to finish, uh, this is a review that we published yet, uh, last year showing how you can use ChatGPT for computational uh, learning. Like you, you can do a lot of bioinformatics with ChatGPT. And we have actually a GitHub that allows you to, to put prompts and, and get feedbacks and then improve for more use, uh, useful cases. And the message is that uh, anyone can become a bioinformatician with this kind of uh, uh, AI. We really need to, now, people that know how to ask questions rather than just uh, answer the questions with, the, with bioinformatics. And with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge the team of my lab. So uh, it is kind of like a, a big group, but uh, we can actually uh, answer some questions in this uh, part. Thank you.